Since I was a kid, ghost stories always made my skin crawl. But like most people, I assumed they were just that stories. That was until I moved to New York and experienced a horror that would haunt me for the rest of my life. It started innocently enough. My name is Jake Larson, and I was fresh out of college with a degree in marketing. Ready to jump into the big city grind, I took a job at a mid-sized firm in Manhattan. Finding an affordable apartment in New York was no easy feat, and I ended up renting a small room in a shared apartment in Queens. It was far from my office and felt like a revolving door of roommates. Between the commute and the cramped living space, I began to feel suffocated. One Friday afternoon, I was in the break room when my colleague, Tom Evans, strolled in with a cup of coffee and a satisfied grin on his face. Hey Jake, you still looking for a new place? He asked. Yeah, you know anywhere decent? I replied, hopeful but cautious. He shrugged. I just found a place, spacious, close to work, and surprisingly affordable. It's a two bedroom, and the rent would be pretty manageable if we split it. This was music to my ears. Tom and I weren't exactly close friends, but he seemed like a good guy. We shared a sense of humor, and I'd seen him work hard during late nights at the office. It was a far cry from the frat-like atmosphere of my current living situation. I eagerly agreed to check the place out with him. That weekend, we headed to the building. Located in a quieter part of town, it was a tall, gray high-rise that looked as though it had been built in the 70s. As we approached, I noticed the building had a peculiar aura, something I couldn't quite put my finger on. Inside, the elevator was as old as the building, with dim lights and creaky buttons. I scanned the panel and was confused when I didn't see a 13 button. There were 15 floors, but they skipped straight from 12 to 14. Tom noticed my expression. You know, some buildings in the city don't have a 13th floor. Superstition, I guess. I laughed it off, but a chill ran down my spine as the elevator doors opened on the 14th floor, our new home. The hallway was long, narrow, and dimly lit, with flickering bulbs that cast eerie shadows on the walls. As we walked, I felt as though the walls were closing in around me. When we entered the apartment, my anxiety faded slightly. The space was large and airy, with a beautiful view of the Manhattan skyline. The building's age lent it a certain charm high ceilings, large windows, and wooden floors that creak slightly underfoot. I could picture myself finally feeling settled here. The deal was too good to pass up, so we signed the lease and moved in the following week. Our first night in the new apartment was quiet, almost peaceful. We unpacked, ordered pizza, and toasted to our new place with a couple of beers. That night, I slept like a rock, the weariness of moving having taken its toll. However, it didn't take long for things to get strange. It started with small things, the creaking sounds in the middle of the night, the feeling of being watched. I'd wake up at odd hours, my heart pounding, only to find everything in place. One night, just as I was about to drift off, I thought I heard footsteps outside our door, but when I checked, the hallway was empty. One night, about a week into our stay, I woke to the unmistakable sound of a woman screaming. It wasn't a playful or startled scream, it was raw and desperate, filled with terror and pain. I sat up in bed, my heart racing as I strained to hear more. The cries were coming from the apartment directly across the hall. I'd never seen anyone enter or leave that unit, so I had assumed it was empty. The thought that someone might be in trouble spurred me into action. I quickly threw on a shirt and stepped out into the hallway. As I reached the door of the neighboring apartment, the screaming stopped. I hesitated, my hand hovering just above the door, unsure of what to do. My skin prickled as an icy silence fell over the hallway. What are you doing out here? Tom's voice came from behind me, startling me. Didn't you hear that? I asked, whispering instinctively. A woman was screaming from this apartment. I think she's in trouble. He frowned, rubbing his eyes. Jake, there's nobody in that apartment. It's been vacant for years. 
but I heard it. I swear, she was screaming like she was, like someone was hurting her, I insisted. Tom looked at me for a long moment, then shrugged. Maybe it was a bad dream. Let's get some sleep. Reluctantly, I followed him back to our apartment. That night, I barely slept. My mind replayed the scream over and over, each time more vivid and haunting. I told myself it was just an overactive imagination, but deep down, I knew what I had heard. The following night, it happened again. This time, I didn't hesitate. I shook Tom awake, and together, we rushed to the apartment door. To my surprise, the door was slightly ajar, swinging open with a soft creak. Tom and I exchanged a wary glance before stepping inside. The apartment was freezing, far colder than the hallway outside. As we walked through the darkened rooms, the air felt thick, suffocating, as though we were being enveloped by an unseen force. The furniture was overturned, the walls smeared with what looked like dried blood. On the floor lay a large, blood-stained kitchen knife. A shiver ran down my spine. The apartment was empty, yet I felt as though we were being watched. My heart pounded in my chest as I scanned the room, looking for any sign of life. Suddenly, the fridge door creaked open on its own, revealing the frozen, twisted face of a woman inside. Her eyes were wide with terror, her mouth open in a silent scream. Her body was contorted, her limbs splayed at unnatural angles as though she had been shoved into the fridge in a hurry. Tom and I bolted out of the apartment, our footsteps echoing down the hallway as we fled back to our unit. We locked the door, our breaths coming in shallow gasps as we tried to process what we had just seen. The next morning, we reported the incident to the building manager, who listened with an unsettling calm. You're not the first tenants to see her, he said, almost dismissively. There was a young couple that lived in that apartment about six years ago. The husband was abusive, a real piece of work. One night, he finally snapped and killed his wife, stuffing her body into the fridge before taking his own life. Since then, every tenant who has stayed in that unit has reported seeing things. He paused, looking us up and down with an almost pitying expression. If I were you, I'd move out as soon as possible. Tom and I exchanged a look, both too stunned to speak. We left his office in silence, each of us lost in our own thoughts. The horror of the previous night replayed in my mind, a sickening feeling twisting in my stomach. Part of me wanted to leave immediately, but another part, a reckless, defiant part, wanted to stay and confront whatever was haunting us. That night, I kept a baseball bat by my bed though I wasn't sure what good it would do against a ghost. As I lay in the dark, every creak and groan of the apartment seemed magnified, each sound sending a fresh wave of fear through me. At around midnight, the screaming started again. This time, it was louder, closer, as though the woman was standing right outside our door. I grabbed the bat, my hands trembling as I approached the door. Tom joined me his face pale but resolute. Together, we stepped into the hallway. The door to the haunted apartment was open again, and as we approached, we could hear soft, labored breathing coming from within. We entered the apartment, the air thick with the scent of decay. The walls were covered in dark, crusty stains, and the floor was littered with shattered glass and torn furniture. The fridge stood open, its contents spilled across the floor but the body was gone. We barely had a moment to process this before the door slammed shut behind us. I spun around, my heart racing as I gripped the bat tightly. Who's there? I called out, my voice echoing through the empty apartment. There was no response, only a soft, mocking laugh that seemed to come from everywhere and nowhere at once. The lights flickered, casting eerie shadows across the walls as the laughter grew louder more menacing. Then, out of the corner of my eye, I saw her. The woman from the fridge, her pale, lifeless form standing in the doorway, her eyes locked onto mine. Her face was twisted in an expression of rage and despair. 
her mouth stretched into a silent scream. I stumbled back, barely able to breathe as she began to move toward us, her movements slow and jerky, like a marionette being pulled by invisible strings. Tom and I bolted for the door, but it wouldn't budge. We were trapped, the woman's ghost drawing closer with each passing second. Desperate, I swung the bat at her, but it passed through her as though she were made of smoke. Her eyes bore into mine, and in that moment, I felt a surge of pain, a deep, soul-crushing sadness that left me gasping for air. It was as though she were pouring all of her suffering into me, her anger, her fear, her despair. Finally, the door flew open, and Tom and I stumbled out into the hallway, our legs barely able to carry us as we fled back to our apartment. We locked the door, each of us collapsing onto the floor, our bodies trembling with fear and exhaustion. The next morning, we packed our things and left without a word. We didn't bother telling the building manager we knew he wouldn't care. As we drove away, I felt a strange mixture of relief and sorrow. I knew we had escaped, but a part of me felt as though we had left a piece of ourselves behind in that cursed building. To this day, I can still hear her screams echoing in my mind. And sometimes when I close my eyes, I see her face, twisted in that final moment of terror, staring back at me from the darkness.